Regardless of the situation, regardless of the age, it's always a sad day when uh, somebody passes on. Regardless of how old uh, you get and how many people um, leave your life because of death, you never get used to it. And so uh, from a college football sense, we will honor Howard Schnellenberger today. I just heard the news just minutes ago. Uh, I know there were posts early in the morning now that I see uh, the stories online, uh, but I just found out about Howard Schnellenberger's passing just a few minutes ago. So I immediately decided to do a live stream. I don't know where this is going to take us, uh, how long it's going to go, but I am open to taking your calls and I will pay my respects to Howard Schnellenberger. Of course, I did not know the man, uh, but just speaking from a college football perspective, his legacy, his impact goes well behind, well beyond the wins and losses and the win-loss record, which will not impress anyone if you look at the wins versus the losses for his coaching career at three different stops in college football, one stop in the NFL. But he changed programs, he changed institutions, and set in motion success for the future at three different stops, most notably, of course, Miami. So Howard Schnellenberger, let's go to the pinnacle of his career and what he will be remembered for, not from a close personal standpoint of his family and friends, because, of course, they remember the man, and that's what's nearest and dearest to them, of course. But speaking on the broad scale from College Football Nation, we will speak to Howard Schnellenberger's legacy and, of course, the pinnacle came on January 1st, 1984. We didn't necessarily expect that to be uh, the pinnacle, but that certainly turned out to be um, a night in which the focus for much of the nation was more on Tom Osborne. And after years of excellence at Nebraska, reaching the climax and hitting the field with what was arguably the best football team in the history of college football that had murdered the big eight and non-conference opponents and run roughshod with three of the best players on offense in the nation in Turner Gill, Mike Rozier, and Irving Fryer. And Miami's passing attack jumped all over Nebraska. And they, of course, held on for the victory with a two-point conversion defended with a deflected pass in the flat that cost Tom Osborne and Nebraska a national championship. That was the focus that night, more so than Miami and Howard Schnellenberger. But what we didn't know that night is that Howard Schnellenberger and Miami birthed a dynasty of their own. And for the next 10 or 12 years, they would be at or near the top of college football. They would win five national championships through 2001. And even today, despite some of the recent struggles of the program on the field, have forged a brand that is distinct and unique and its own. So Howard Schnellenberger was at the forefront of that resurgence. I won't even call it a resurgence because Miami football had been dead forever, an emergence. Uh, this was a football program. This is unthinkable today. This was a school that thought seriously about dropping football, about ending the sport, dropping football. The failures were that significant and that lengthy for decade after decade after de decade. Howard Schnellenberger, though, saw potential. He saw the talent and he saw the destination. And he put that together to build a football program quickly. 1979, Jim Kelly was his quarterback, and Miami got good quickly. And then, of course, uh, won a national championship in 1983. We've got a caller on the line. We'll go to the call, and then I will continue to pay my respects. Uh, Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Hey, Mark. Uh, Steve, how are you, sir? Dave, I am doing just fine. How are you today? <clears throat> hey, uh, just really, you know, obviously being a Notre Dame fan, not a huge Miami fan, but uh, 
you have to acknowledge uh, his accomplishments and what he did for a program. And I feel like really, like the only reason I called in was just to express my condolences to him and his family, to that the Miami fan base, and that, uh, you know, obviously they lost a great one. And it's a, it's a sad day for them, I'm sure. Uh, I don't know what else I could say, but I, I think it's the right thing to do that we uh, – sometimes set aside our differences and say our prayers and express, you know, that, that we uh, probably lost one of the, the greatest coaches who maybe doesn't get acknowledged as much as he should. I don't know if you agree with all that or not. but I do. Uh, as I was just uh, explaining for him, it goes well beyond wins and losses and the record that is usually referenced first and foremost when a head coach dies. Okay, what was his record? But uh, it goes way beyond that because what he did at Miami has lasted until today. And, of course, he wasn't alone, but he yeah, was at the really forefront. Um, no, keep talking, Mark. I, I, I interrupt her. I'm sorry. Well, I'm just saying he was just at the um, – uh, of course, you can't do it alone, uh, but he was the, the lightning bolt. He was the leader he uh, forged something in Miami that seems reasonable, inevitable, doable now because it's been done. And with the plethora of talent there in South Florida seems like a given, but it wasn't when he took over the program, the program was dormant and dead and uh, no one cared. No one went to the games. They lost just about every game. They almost gave up football. They were in a financial mess. And uh, he saw the potential again. I think he saw the destination of kids wanting to stay in South Florida or go to South Florida to play. And he saw the great wealth of talent that wasn't staying home and thought he would be the man to keep them home. And he did. Yeah, the other thing I think is he was able to um, and I'll say this in a very diplomatic manner, temper a lot of the players that were there located within that Miami area where they don't always <clears throat> come from the best backgrounds. They don't have the, uh, what I would call a, a great father figure, a great role figure, and he found, uh, you know, like a way to, to channel all them into a football team and get them to... Uh, well, I don't even know how to explain this right, but he found a way to keep them on the team, keep them in school, and for them to play together as a team and, you know, be cohesive. And, um, you know, I've, I've uh, been on some shows with uh, some of the other guys that you work with, also one and uh, Cam, and they asked, you know, hey, uh, what do you think about the, like, the Miami players, their state of mind, and, and where they come from, their background? They, they come from a tough background. I mean, it, it's tough, you know, and I can't imagine uh, growing up in that area, but, you know, they pull through it. That's uh, an excellent point that you make because we know that when a young man leaves home, usually for the first time, and whether he's traveling 15 miles to school or 1,500 miles to school, it's a new life. It's just a new life, and he needs uh, a mentor. Um, and many young men don't have a father figure because they don't have a father who's at home. And uh, I think you touch upon something that uh, even even for those young men that do, um, they, they have a different uh, surrounding of people, and that head coach and the position coaches become like father figures. And especially if they're absent of that at home, then um, I think that you, you've hit upon something that um, that he capitalized on uh, in a good way in, in being uh, attractive as to to families for for serving that that uh, role, filling that role uh, for many of those uh, student athletes. Yeah, and you know, Mark, the the, the crazy thing is like. Other than seeing him standing, you know, on the sideline coaching, like, I really don't know anything about him. Uh, I'm guessing you know a lot more than I do, but 
Um, I never saw anything detractive from his uh, demeanor. He always seemed like a pretty steady headed guy. Uh, but yeah, that, that's a challenging thing to, to bring a, a lot of kids in there and you, you don't know what they've gone through as young men and you don't know what they're struggling with. And, uh, be able to gather them in for a common goal and have them succeed the way they did. And, you know, my kudos to him. He obviously could not have been dealing with something easy. And I just wanted to pay my respects to him and his family. And then let me get off here. Well, David, thank you so much for uh, jumping on here early. And uh, I know that this was uh, a sudden notification. I didn't plan on doing this. And again, it, I just saw the news and, and decided to go live. So, Thanks for uh, adding your insight. We always appreciate that, Dave. You know that. Yes. Hey, you take care of yourself and you have a great rest of your day. And I'll uh, just sit back and watch the chat and listen to what you have to say. Appreciate that, David. Have a good day. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Our friend uh, David Knight uh, giving his perspective. And, um, yeah, it's been a long time since uh, I necessarily – thought about uh, Howard Schnellenberger's legacy outside of Miami because it gets brought up from time to time with all the Miami coverage that we do here. Uh, of course, we're talking about the here and now and talking about current events and the current football team 95% of the time. But it, at times, of course, because of what the football programs accomplished since 19. 7980 and certainly since 1983, his name has to come up and it does from time to time. Um, and it's just remarkable. Um, I just stated this last night, I believe to, uh, Brad Tejeda, we did a live show uh, on the Miami channel last night. Check that out. Uh, Brad with some great insight into the current uh, situation, of course, and, uh, all the recruiting and the, um, spring practice going on. Uh, but that Miami's unique, uh, as a football program for this reason. And, and Florida State would be the next in line, and they would be a list of two. They would be a list of two, and Miami would be uh, the first of the two, would be that football success has come over decades and decades of time, and those that original group of schools that was successful back in the, in the 40s and 50s and even prior to that, and we know what those schools are, uh, there's six or seven of them, Ohio State, Michigan, Notre Dame, USC, Texas, Oklahoma, and then a little bit later, Nebraska and Penn State joined in Alabama, of course, uh, and then some others are more on the periphery uh, near that top tier, but it pretty much hasn't changed, and any schools that have risen have not been able to sustain it. Oregon. Uh, Clemson, I'll put in a different category, and I don't want to go through the whole litany of reasons why and tears and all of that. But to make the point that, uh, as Cam Underwood, our friend at uh, State of the U, says uh, many times, uh, Miami's a microwave dynasty. They came onto the scene and lit it up like that. Um, there was barely a football program. It was a skeleton of a football program, and within four years, they're the national champion. Uh, Florida State came out of nowhere. I, I made a statement to a number of callers uh, just recently who were calling and asking about uh, certain games and the rise of certain programs that uh, Florida State, much in the same mold as Miami, had one guy arrive. And, of course, he didn't do it alone. People had to help him, but he was the guy that saw the vision and galvanized the support, and that was Bobby Bowden at Florida State. Same deal. Florida State had winless seasons in the mid-70s. We're routinely winning two games, uh, but but I had a winless season in there, and Bobby Bowden, bam, saw the same thing Howard Schnellenberger saw in the state of Florida, and that was potential. That was just, you know, hundreds of exceptionally talented football players that were going out of state. And harness that and bam florida state was on the scene like that as well they were a national power going from like 1975 abysmal to 1978 79 boom national power playing in orange bowls for national championships and in miami of course 
at that same time period. You could say on one hand that Florida State beat them to the punch by a couple of years, but Miami surpassed them, of course, in attaining that national championship in 1983. So those two programs, and especially Miami, unlike any other programs in the history of college football, So it's remarkable, and he is the he's the innovator, the creator, the uh, the one who was able to forge that uh, that initial surge. Got Kane's call in. We appreciate all the Miami fans, all the college football fans that uh, are jumping on board here. So much appreciate that. Um, and uh, of course, Howard Schnellenberger had. Other stops along the way and was actually, this is uh, typically uncommon for a big time college football coach, had an NFL head coaching job before he ever coached in college, ever coached in college as a head coach uh, for the Baltimore Colts, suffered through a four and 10 season in 1973. I believe he was there in 73, 74. Barely got to coach the next season. They fired him not even mid-season the next year with the Baltimore Colts. And that was a franchise that was dominant. But they had hit the skids. And they would remain on the skids for quite some time, even though they they had a quick surge after Schnellenberger with Burt Jones at quarterback. But uh, he didn't get much of an opportunity in the NFL one season in a few games. In 1973-74, then he got back into college coaching, offensive coordinator at the Miami Dolphins as well. That was the the job just prior to uh, taking the head coaching job at Miami in 1979. And then unfortunately, and I believe he regrets this to a certain extent, and um, because I don't want to speak out of turn. Uh, I know that he's commented on it. I've heard not necessarily firsthand from him all the time on this subject, but from others who have spoken to him or referenced various interviews that uh, what happened following that 1983 season in leading a national championship. So basically he takes over this, this program in rubbish, lifts them to a national championship, and then he leaves. Not for an NFL head coaching job, but for a USFL coaching opportunity. So the USFL was just starting. Man, for all the USFL football I watched, I'm trying to get a a lean on exactly when they started. They had already started. The league had already launched, I believe, in 1983. I might be wrong on that. Somebody might have to fact check me on that. I don't want to be wrong because I don't know if he came in at the commencement of the league or the league had already had a year under its belt. But that 1984 season was either going to be the first or the second USFL season. I don't think there was a 1982 season. So the league was new regardless. And Howard Schnellenberger was offered an opportunity to coach the Miami franchise. And then the USFL, the the franchise was suspended by the owner where he, there was some kind of mess. Uh, I would have to look back into the history books where the the owner uh, didn't go through with his commitment to purchase the team and the team then became defunct and they moved to central Florida and Howard Schnellenberger didn't want to go with them. And therefore he was in limbo and uh, he could have stayed with a franchise, I guess, but uh, didn't want to go to Central Florida. Uh, and then they became the Orlando Orlando Renegades. Memory serves me. And uh, so Howard Schnellenberger was actually out of a job for a year. So he never got his shot with the USFL. And then he went to Louisville, which he had ties to Kentucky. He played at Kentucky at the University of Kentucky back in the 50s. So he goes to Louisville. In 1985, and that was a horrendous football program, and he made Louisville respectable. Louisville hadn't had a winning season in seven, eight years, and even that winning season was not viewed as it would be today. They were not playing 
major competition week to week to week. And he put them on a, a major college level platform. Uh, he had a few rough seasons at Louisville, took him a little bit of time. He was there from 85 into the mid nineties. He pulled off a one loss season at Louisville, pulled off a 10 and one season in 1990 and blasted Alabama in the Fiesta bowl, 34 to seven. I remember watching that game and, uh, Blasted uh, Alabama and Louisville finished ranked for the first time ever under Howard Schnellenberger. And here's a football program that's been been good, generally good ever since he left. Generally, Louisville's been a top 25 to 30 program in the country. And it's not a shock when Louisville goes uh, eight and four, nine and three and finishes in the top 25. So again, that did not exist before Howard Schnellenberger, at least for the interim. I don't know if we go back to the Johnny Unitas days at Louisville, possibly. But uh, so he rebuilt that program. And then he had an odd, and I'll get to some of the comments in just a second. And of course, the, the phone lines are open. I don't want to miss any calls that may be coming in. Then he had an odd situation at Oklahoma. So he's offered the head coaching job at Oklahoma, which is, Blue blood right at the top of the line. This is in 1995. He takes the Oklahoma job after having all that success in rebuilding Louisville and making it a program it had never been before, a respectable program. Then he goes to Oklahoma and um, they got off to a hot start. It's in the top 10. And I'm thinking, along with most people that observe college football at the time, I was working actually at a CBS station covering the SEC at that point, 1995, um, that this is a marriage made in heaven. This is going to be great. You take um, a program that's got the legacy, tradition, facilities, brand name, all of that, and you marry it with a guy who is a proven winner. It just didn't work there. He um, he was disappointed and turned off by a lot of the attitude and the uh, entitlement with the locker room, the players, the administration, everybody. Uh, you know, he was wor- he was used to working for the underdog and being the underdog, and let's grind it and work it and bust our tails and take this thing over. And they were probably just resting on their laurels. To a certain extent, it, it's it sounds like that. It has that vibe based on uh, a lot of what I've read in the conversations. And uh, he just could not win the locker room. Maybe didn't try to win the locker room. Was a bit turned off by the the atmosphere and approach with the Oklahoma football program. And they went into a tailspin, and he finished five hundred something in that range, slightly losing record, and uh, he resigned. And even made the statement something to the effect that this was not the situation. Uh, I misread the situation and he, he both took blame, but also said, this was just a situation that I didn't read uh, before I took it on. And it's just not a good match. And he left in a very classy way. He goes to Florida Atlantic. He builds that football program from scratch. So he's the perfect guy to do that. Uh, at this point, he's almost a Florida guy to a certain extent. That's that's going to be the legacy. People are going to remember Howard Schnellenberger as being kind of a Florida guy. Miami, of course, even though it was only four seasons, five seasons. And then uh, Florida Atlantic later, where he became the athletic director uh, as well. And then the defunct USFL franchise. Uh, not, not really a Florida guy. But... Um, He's the guy to build a program and uh, was so associated and loved in Florida at that point that he was the perfect guy to to build a football program. And look at Florida Atlantic now. They are firmly entrenched as a solid Conference USA FBS program. And that started with Howard Schnellenberger being there for the first 10 or 11 seasons. A lot of great comments here in the live chat. That uh, we greatly appreciate. 
from Thomas and Aaron and others. Yeah, I gave you pretty much uh, Baltimore Colts head coaching stint, 1973-74 in that range forward. I would need to dive back into, I know he played at Kentucky. I don't want to assume he's from Kentucky. But uh, we talked about the college stints and the NFL stints. But prior to taking over with the Baltimore Colts, I know that he was an assistant coach. in college a number of places and yes he was at alabama let me get the years on that because i think that was that uh, bart star kenny stabler joe namath i got him out of order star namath stabler think about that <laughs> think about that at the university of alabama those were their three consecutive starting quarterbacks from 19 19- 6364. No, 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 no. My bad. Star would have preceded that. Star's first year in the NFL, I believe, was 56. So he would have been mid 50s. And then Namath about six, seven years later, 64, uh, 63, 64 in that range. I think Namath's first NFL season was 1965. And then that would have been Stabler after that. So they weren't back to back to back, but three Hall of Fame quarterbacks pretty much in a 10-year span at uh, one school. That's that's pretty crazy when you think star nameth Stabler. So, yeah, Howard Schnellenberger was the offensive coordinator at Alabama from 61 to 65. So that's the Namath stint right there. Then he went into the NFL with the Rams and the Dolphins, and it was the Dolphins. Uh, he was the offensive coordinator i forget this or i did forget this or i just forgot to mention it i knew this yes he was the offensive coordinator for the undefeated miami dolphins team of 1972 so he coached miami into two super bowls as an offensive coordinator under don shula so that gave him even more cachet in the miami area as a football commodity once he took over the head coaching job at the University of Miami, having been a main player for those Dolphins teams, 70, 71, 72. Uh, so those last two teams, again, went to the Super Bowl and the 72 team. So, so that's how he gets the Baltimore Colts head coaching job in 73, is being offensive coordinator for <laughs> arguably the greatest team in history, even though they ran the ball just about 98% of the time. Uh, still, he was the O.C., uh, we got Wayne on the line. Good to see you talking uh, Florida State, Miami. He says, putting the rivalry with the Seminoles and the Hurricanes on the back burner to offer condolences to the U and their fans without Schnellenberger and Bowden, this rivalry would not be what it is today. There's no question about that. Who knows what would have happened? You would think with the resources and the recruiting footprint at those two schools in that area of the country, in that state, you would think somebody would have come along and made it happen. But anytime you're talking about the advent of anything special and you can pretty much pinpoint it to one guy, whether that's in industry or business or music or sports, you sometimes can think, okay, well, there was just so much potential there that somebody would have made it happen, but who knows? It might've been three years later. It might've been 13 years later. And not in quite the same way. So again, appreciate everybody uh, jumping on here to uh, offer their condolences to the Schnellenberger family. He died at the age of 87. So he lived a good long life. Uh, it was not just, um, again, his coaching ability and his ability to draw in people and organize and, and build and um, relate to people, but um, he was he was a bit of a character, and I don't mean that in a negative way. Like sometimes you would state that somebody's a character, uh, and uh, no, no, it's just uh, he just had a persona. It was it was um, he's a big guy, played college football, uh, just a big guy, uh, had that big stash, and had that just gravelly deep voice that I don't have. 
Uh, he just had that, uh, that uh, it just made him distinct, it just made him a character. It's like an Ed Ogeron today, um, that regardless of his ability, regardless of what he accomplishes, there's going to be a standout. The, the image, the, the brand is going to stand out. There's a personality, a persona might be the best word. Aaron Short, yes, talking about uh, the USFL of the 80s. You had the Michigan Panthers. You had the, again, Orlando Renegades. You mentioned the Stallions of Birmingham, the New Jersey Generals with Herschel Walker and Brian Sipe. You had the uh, Arizona Wranglers, the Chicago Blitz, uh, the New Orleans I don't, Breakers. You yeah, the Memphis Breakers, the, the Memphis Showboats, the Memphis Showboats, the New Orleans, I don't remember who they were, San Antonio with Doug Williams, at quarterback, and then Jim Kelly. No, Jim Kelly was at Houston, the Houston Gamblers, the San Antonio Stampede. Who else did we have? The Baltimore, Baltimore, Baltimore. They had a really good team. You had the Philadelphia Stars. You had the Boston. Forgetting the Boston team. And of course, Doug Flutie played for the Generals. Okay, we're getting off into the USFL and Howard Schnell and Berger never coached there. 82. There we go. Johnny Truth was on campus during Howard Schnellenberger's time. Very cool. Uh, Mark East, I appreciate that you can call Bernie Kosar. Uh, I appreciate the the loyalty, of course. Uh, our personal favorites are kind of our personal goats. Uh, Bernie Kosar, I think he's down the list when it goes to Cleveland Browns great quarterbacks. Where is he on that list? But of course, uh, we're speaking of Kosar. If you're unfamiliar, if you're watching the show today, Bernie Kosar led that national championship team of 1983 at quarterback. Came back in 84 as a sophomore. So he was a freshman quarterback and not running the option, as was the Norman College football, like slinging it back in those days. Freshman quarterback wins the national championship. Comes back in 84. Jimmy Johnson is coach. Johnson and Kosar, who later reunited in uh, Dallas, actually, uh, to get the Cowboys to a Super Bowl when Troy Aikman was hurt. But anyway, Johnson, Kosar, and um, they they stumbled around that season. They were very talented, played a tough schedule, lost to UCLA in the Fiesta Bowl, and then uh, Kosar, this was pretty unprecedented at the time he graduated. He had only played two seasons of college football. He already had graduated. Smart, smart guy. And went in the supplemental draft to the Cleveland Browns and then became the starting quarterback of the Cleveland Browns as a rookie. Gary Danielson started the season. Kosar then became the starter. So anyway, Bernie Kosar, go to the Browns. Well, of course, Otto Grahams at the top of that Cleveland Browns quarterback list. Uh, you'd have to go with... Uh, then, and then it's a pretty good run for second place on the Browns quarterback list. You would have to go Bernie Kosar, Brian Sipe would be in the running. It's pretty slim pickings. The quarterbacks have been awful ever since uh, the franchise folded. Now you got Baker, but uh, yeah, Kosar would be in the running for the second spot. You'd have uh, Milt Plum, Bill Nelson, Brian Sipe are probably at the forefront. Uh, along with Bernie Kosar for the second place, second place on the Cleveland Browns GOAT list of quarterbacks. Phil was at, uh, at an FAU game. Schnellenberger was recognized at halftime. Salty Lemon, good to see all of you here.
Browning Nagel at Louisville. Yes. Good job, Aaron Short. Browning Nagel, who was then uh, drafted by the New York Jets. Ballard, good to see you. Randy says uh, Howard started the belief in Miami recruiting only South Florida, and he would leave his, what am I missing there? His Pope at a recruit's house on purpose. Go back to the next day for, all right. Uh, Yes, there you go, Johnny Truth. That's what it was like right there. Two free tickets to the game when we bought a Big Whopper. Big Whopper meal across the street at Burger King. Yes, the Boston Breakers, New Orleans Breakers. There we go. Yes, David, Brian Sipe. Yes, if you want an education on Miami football past, not present, if you want one present, of course, you stay right here, and uh, we talk Miami football all the time. But past, you check out those 30 for 30s produced by ESPN. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Uh, always supportive of the show. Thank you, everyone. I appreciate uh, everyone jumping on here. Anytime we have breaking news in college football, to a certain extent, I will get on here if at all possible. When Mark Richt stepped down, when Manny Diaz was hired, when Mark D'Antonio stepped down, when Willie Taggart was fired, and other times. Coaching uh, transitions, hirings and firings. We have just immediately jumped online to uh, to talk to all of you. All right, everyone. Great to see everybody out there. I just uh, thought, again, that uh, we would honor the great uh, Howard Schnellenberger. And uh, I do have a call coming in, so let's take that. Hey, it's the voice of college football. How are you doing, Mark Rogers? Line. Hey, David. The voice of college. Yes, the voice of college football, Mark Rogers. How are you, sir? Kind I'm doing well. Today. I'm Let's good. Pa or yeah, passing of uh, Coach Schnellenberger, who helped build that program. Um, that, uh, you know, that game against Miami was all, uh, voted one of the great bowl games of all time. And at the time, that was a major upset, was it not, Mark? I mean, wasn't Nebraska fairly heavily favored going into that game to, to win the national championship? I think the spread was 17, if I recall correctly. Wow. Right. Well, remember, that was a, that was a, a, a Nebraska team. You know, they had, you know, Mike Rozier, who won the Heisman, Irving Fryer, Great offensive line, Turner Gill at quarterback. Um, but, you know, I, I think what Miami did at the time is, you know, Schnellenberger is associated with a lot of great quarterbacks, you know, because he had, you know, when he was at Alabama, I think he was an assistant coach down there when they had Joe Namath, right? And yes. Stabler as well was he an assistant when they had Stabler too. We just uh, looked at his uh, coaching list. He was there from 61 to 65. Okay. Mm, I think that predated Kenny Stabler just barely. Okay. So he might have just missed Stabler, but he was definitely there for the name of era. I think Stabler then, was a know, rookie in 68. I'm thinking out loud. I'm sorry, David. I think Stabler was a rookie oh. in 68. I'm not positive on that, but I'm, mm -hmm. I might be off by a year. So he might've been there at the beginning of Stabler's career at Alabama. He was also there with the Baltimore Colts with Burt Jones. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, his first uh, quarterback at Miami was Jim Kelly. Right. I was going to say, because he had both Kelly and Kosar with, with Miami. You know, he you know he recruited a lot of Florida players, but he came up to the Midwest to get his quarterbacks. You know, he got Pennsylvania to get Jim Kelly and uh, Boardman, Ohio, to get Bernie Kosar. That's a good point. Yeah. So, 
you know, I find that a little bit interesting. Um, but yeah, I mean, well, you know, and I, I gotta think, Mark, back in that era, I, I think with the, with the Miamis and the Florida States, and then, you know, eventually Florida with Spurrier and all the, those teams started to do, I would say they introduced the path to college football because I think there were teams that were throwing the football before then, but they kind of introduced that pro style, spread people out and kind of run a pro offense and throw the football around, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, they certainly did it better than just about anybody else. BYU. Yeah. You know, BYU was the team that um, was throwing it around there in the late 70s already with uh, Robbie Bosco, preceded by Jim McMahon and uh, that crew. Let's see, McMahon's last year there was 81. Trying to think if they had a quarterback. Yeah. Gifford Nielsen was, uh, he might have been the first one. I think he was the first one who then played for the Oilers uh, that was a a quarterback that put up big numbers at BYU. But uh, in, in terms of competing for national championships and and not just being kind of a sideshow, yeah, Miami was yeah. was pretty much the team that that threw it around. Yeah, and I think that that was kind of the advantage that they had at that period of time over the Oklahomas and the Nebraskas and those teams is they had the they were kind of running an NFL type offense with that type of passing game that those teams had never seen because I remember uh, they did a, a flashback to that game and they had they interviewed both Bernie Kosar and Turner Gill and the one of the reasons that I think Bernie had said that they were confident they could win that game is you know they they knew that. Uh, Oh, that Nebraska had not seen a passing game in their conference like like Miami at that time. Yeah, no doubt. And um, a lot of college football started to catch up pretty quickly. Even look at our Buckeyes. Look at Ohio State, how much they mm-hmm. threw the football yep. under Earl Bruce yep. compared to what they had done just a couple of years earlier. You know, if, if you're watching a, an Ohio sure. State game from the Arch Leachster Mike Tomzak into the Jim Carsado's time period, they're throwing the ball. It's not prolific based on today's standards, but you know, they're throwing the ball 25, 30 times when eight years earlier, they're throwing the ball five or six or eight times a game. Well, sure. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, Woody was throwing the ball less than 10 times a game. That's what I was always going to say. So and you did a nice piece. Uh, I know when, when coach Bruce had passed away, Mark, uh, but, um, uh, you know, or he kind of introduced the passing game. Now, Woody actually gave him a good quarterback in Schleister to where, he, you know, they could open up the offense and they had some good receivers with Donnelly and Williams. So th- th- that was kind of the first year of the pass being kind of introduced there, you know, with that 79 team that you, you talk about, Mark. So, so, so I, ap- throw the ball around. And, I apologize, yeah. David. The, the reason I brought that up was to get to the point that even toward the late 80s, Miami was mm-hmm. running into Oklahoma and Nebraska in the Orange Bowl with national championships on the line. And while Miami helped foster yeah. the passing game and it was picked up in various parts of the country in the Pac-12 predominantly, uh, spots in the Big Ten and and uh, and from a lot of independent schools that were throwing the ball well, the Big Eight right. was still the Southwest Conference, the Big Eight. And, and much of the SEC, yep. if you watched an Auburn game in yep. particular, um, they were still running the ball 90% of the time and still running an antiquated offense. So even though they were loaded with talent yep. and were bringing these undefeated teams or one-loss teams to national championship scenarios, even six and seven years later, they couldn't handle Miami. Sure. Well, and I think that's what forced, you know, the Nebraska's and the Oklahoma's to obviously eventually transition, um, you know, and change their strategies over the years. Uh, it, it really, particularly defensively, I know that you, you mentioned Nebraska having to recruit more speed on the defensive side of the ball to, to defend those types of offenses, which they eventually did in the 90s. Of course, they had their great run over that period of time. But, um, yeah, I, I think, interesting, Schnellenberger went to the USFL. And also, Steve Spurrier, I think, was coaching in the USFL at the time, if I'm not mistaken, as well, Mark. Yes, he was. So, so the two coaches been... that kind of built up Florida. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Why can't I remember Steve Spurrier's team? It was, uh... oh, 
He was in Tampa. I Tampa, think the Tampa rent, the Tampa, not the Renegades. Was he the rent? The the Bandits, the Tampa Bay Bandits. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it was interesting. The two coaches that would build up Miami and would build up Florida mm. were both in the U.S. develop at that. Yeah. Yeah, and what? Again, go ahead. Go ahead, David. Go ahead. So I was just going to make a point. I never realized he coached at Oklahoma, but you know, I guess that was just such a forgotten period of time. And I think most Oklahoma fans would say the '90s was, you know, kind of a lost period there. I think he was probably was he right before the other coach that just recently passed away, Blake. He was after. He was after Gibbs and before Blake. Yes. Okay. 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 I wasn't sure on that one. Yeah, I did. You know, because this was such a bad. I mean, in the nineties, I'm sure it's an era of football, but most Oklahoma fans would probably like to forget, right? And I don't know if you caught this part of the show, but, um, you know, I, I jump on these things and I try to rely on, on on what I remember in my knowledge of what happened 30 and 40 years ago. And, and so I couldn't really detail it too well, but he had a very odd state, Oklahoma. It was only one season. And there was a lot of, as you might imagine, there was a lot of um, hoopla surrounding him going to Oklahoma. And wow, what can he do with his program? Because they're... The, they've got the facilities and the uh, the brand and the image and all of that, and and he's uh, a proven winner and builds programs. So uh, people just expected it to take off, and he just he didn't like it there. It wasn't a good fit. He was openly critical of just the way they approached football, mm-hmm. and I, I think he was used to being an underdog and used to being a grinder. And, you know, we've, we've got to kind of kick this into gear and, and take over versus I think they were more um, resting on their laurels as a great football brand and, and uh, took themselves a little too seriously for him. And um, it, yeah. it just wasn't a good fit. It didn't work. Mm-hmm. I agree. Well, I, and then I, I do remember those Louisville teams. I, I believe, did, didn't he have two good quarterbacks there? He had Browning and Nagel. I think, didn't he also coach Brom as well? Yeah. Yes, he did. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I think we referenced that one game that they played against Ohio State that we talked about. I think he was the coach, like, in, was it 92? They played Ohio State at the Horseshoe two consecutive seasons. So I believe it was 91-92. One of those games was a one-point sure. game. They, they lost both of them. Yeah, it was a close game. And one was, yeah, one was like one point game down to the wire. Uh, the other game was was kind of a um, cruise control, not a blowout, but you know, like a 31-16 kind of game, something like that. Right. Yeah, I, I do remember him doing a good job at Louisville. I think he had pretty good teams in the early 90s. I think he had a pretty good team in 91 or 93. Did he have a good team in 93 as well, Mark? Yeah, so I mentioned the one team that I remember and this was a big shock to people that don't follow college football every day, that Louisville all of a sudden shows up in the Fiesta Bowl, and they played Alabama. That was either in 90 or 91. I think it was 90 uh, that they played okay. Alabama in the Fiesta Bowl, and they slaughtered them. And that team finished 10-1. Okay. 10-1-1, okay. and one, yeah. possibly. Yeah, it was a Bill Curry area down there in Alabama, I think. I think uh, Gene Stallings had taken over by then. Oh, okay. I'd have to verify that. But I think uh, I remember Stallings on the sideline for that one. Yeah. By the way, co- coached under two legends, the Bear and uh, Don Shield. They're not bad. Yeah. It's a good company there. Um. Uh, but real quick, Mark, he played at Kentucky. I, I wonder if he played under the Bear there, because the Bear coached at Kentucky. I bet he did. Uh, I'll check the years on that. Yeah, Stallings' first year at Alabama was 90. Bear Bryant at Kentucky. That sure sounds like, because uh, he started at Kentucky, Bear Bryant did, then, of course, went to Texas A&M. And uh, I think that was more late 50s. So, yes, Bear Bryant... Hmm. 
Kentucky 46 to 53. I would have to double check that against Schnellenberger's years there. But that would seem to make sense because then he took him on as an assistant right. coach not that long after that. Yeah. Well, it's, it always helps to learn under the, the masters. That's yeah. for sure. So, yeah. I mean, you know, two, two legends there. Well, as always, a pleasure to reminisce with you and talk college football. Uh, Howard Schnellenberger, great coach, you know, RIP and uh, my condolences. And uh, good job with the show, Mark. Appreciate that, David. Have a good day. Take care now. Bye-bye. All right, let's take our another call here that we've got in queue. Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football. Who's on the line? Good afternoon, Mark. This is uh, Kevin. Oh, it's Kevin. Georgia. Yeah, I see today? it now. I'm doing well. How are you? Doing great, doing great. I uh, just wanted to say uh, RIP to PB, and that's as far as program builder, as far as uh, Coach Snellenberger. I mean, because when I think of him, I mean, as far as in the physical, is that dog on mustache and the pipe. I mean, those are two things. I mean, I guess he would be the football version of Santa Claus. But, you know, having a better portfolio as far as when it comes to the X's and O's than uh, St. Nick, though. But, uh, one thing I wanted to put out there, Mark, as far as for an idea as far as a, a future topic, and it's in regards to, I know it's on a couple of occasions, or well, at least on one occasion, you did the all-time team. And I don't know whether you have ever done as far as an all-time program as far as athlete. And my question would be, um, as far as doing it in a four, in a playoff format, and when it came to some schools, it was easy. But then when it came to other schools, there was like a almost four and five deep. So it was difficult cut to make at particular position. But then when it came to, like, example, Florida, I mean, it would be a decision that you have to make as far as would Spurrier be your coach or would Spurrier be your quarterback? So that's, um, you know, and, like, and when it came to, and as far as the, Playoff format, I was going to put out there Mark 18 because I feel that you could get a, a true as far as gauge as far as an 18. Now, I defer to you as far as whether you, whether you would think that eight would be too few. No, I'm good with eight. We had a uh, live stream maybe about six weeks ago where I took out the board and went through my system and I – I proposed eight teams. Now, along those lines, as far as, uh, say, for instance, you know, as far as when I, you know, that uh, suggestion was more of a, okay, say, for instance, if you did Ohio State. Now, when it came to Ohio State, I could not, the only issue I had was really at quarterback because the only guy that I could just think of off the top as far as all time, I take that back. Now that I'm, 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 Speaking, I would say that's the only position where I would allow you to go three D. Everyone else would have to just be one deep across the board. And as far as Ohio, Ohio State, I would think it would be what Fleister and maybe Troy Smith. The 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 place where you get into a difficult time with Ohio State, and if you broke down other schools, you'd run into the same issue is there might be a quarterback who had the best season in school history for one year, but he was a one-year guy versus the guy that had three or four years as the starting quarterback. And then you also have to take into consideration different eras, throw the ball, uh, different rates, so you can't compare these guys statistically necessary. If, if, if you're going to go statistically for one season, then your quarterback's either Dwayne Haskins or Justin Fields at Ohio State. But I think Troy Smith was better as a collegiate quarterback. Yeah, I think Troy Smith is the best quarterback in Ohio State history as a collegiate player, but it's close. It's close. Yeah. And and that was my thing as far as I tried to look across the board because even when it came to uh, the University of Alabama, when I was thinking as far as their all-time team, I could only really think of maybe on that old line, off the top, I was going to say Baumhauer, 
Hannah and Dwight Stevenson. Wow. And I would yeah. have to be, and I would have to really, really move up until the current. I would be hard pressed as far as honestly, Mark, two thousand athlete as far as that two thousand, you know, from twenty from two thousand to twenty twenty. I would be hard pressed as far as to say who could, you know, match those three guys. Yeah, those guys. John Hanna, many people consider him to be the greatest uh, offensive lineman in the history of the NFL. And the other two were no slouches either. Uh, I believe Dwight Stevenson's in the Hall of Fame. Yes, yes, yes. And and that was just really the thing. I mean, it just it just you know popped in my mind as far as the day, and I knew that as far as that you you know done as far as the playoffs, then as far as you had spoken in reference to say you know certain schools as far as certain classes. But I just you know just kind of just blew me away for a moment to think of if you broke those broke say maybe eight schools down as in their best all-time players. And we're not talking about as far as doggone uh, your pro resume and not even really particularly as far as one year, but as far as a career. And, you know, whether and I would say a minimum mark of, say, two to three years and, you know, put it out there because even – because and, and and just you know, briefly and in closing, Mark, as far as say, for instance, University of Miami. And when it came to some positions, I, it was like doggone, you know, finding needles in a haystack. But then when it came to like DB, I could easily state three, but then I was hard pressed as far as the fourth one because of so so much depth. DB, for example, okay, I could say Sean Taylor, I could say Ed Reed and Al Blade, but then who would that fourth person be? And then when it came to the linebackers market, maybe I might make you fall off your stool as far as that's concerned. The first three that really came to mind was the trio of Batman, Flash, and Superman as far as Armstead, Barrow, and Smith. Hmm. And and then, I mean, I know that, okay, I was, you know, as far as being blasphemous by not saying Ray Lewis, but those are the first three that just readily came to mind. So you're looking for an all-time team for major schools? Yes, sir. That's what you're looking for. 18 format. As far as coaches concerned, only one coach. We're not going to go the dog on OCDC. As far as quarterback, would be the only position in which you can go three deep. Why are you going three back, deep at quarterback? Two. Well, I'm just saying. I'm just giving you the option because in some. Okay. Well, let's. Okay. Well, let's do. Let's make it. Let's make it difficult for for the viewers then, Mark. Okay, one deep across the board. You now, as far one... as on the defense. I I, I I'm guess I, Mark. I guess I'm fl- I'm sorry to to, to interrupt, Kevin. Uh, I guess I, I the quarterback's the most important position. Uh, I believe that the offensive line is the most important position when you take all five players put together, but that's five players. Um, I, I guess I just I always try to play the contrarian here because I think there's just too much credit given to the quarterback and not enough to other positions, especially the offensive line. So for example, um, Somebody can look this up. Don't hold me to this to the exact degree. But in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, I believe there are four or five times as many quarterbacks as offensive linemen in the Hall of Fame. When, in fact, there are five times more offensive linemen on the field than the quarterback. So if you're judging and evaluating every position fairly over time, because think about it. In any given year, let's take the NFL or college football, in any given year, it could be a strong year for running backs and a weak year for centers. You know, but over time, it evens out. So actually, if you're evaluating pro football fairly, the history of the NFL, there should should be five times more offensive linemen in the Hall of Fame than quarterbacks. Point well taken. Point well taken. Um, that being the case, Mark, across the board, as far as hey, you line up your eleven against my eleven, and and that's it. Because even when it came to Ohio State and the O line, I could only think of one guy, and that was Orlando Pace. I couldn't think of the other four all the time. Oh well, I can think of all sorts of guys that uh, would fit the bill there. I, I'm just uh, trying to determine whether I would t- tackle this myself, which part of me wants to just 
tackle it myself, produce videos and say, here it is. And you guys can uh, give me your feedback or to say, okay, we're doing Alabama. I'm going to bring on every Alabama person I can find who's legitimate. We're going to do a live stream and we're, this is all we're talking about. And we're going to create an all time Alabama team. Then we'll do Miami, Ohio state, whomever else. Going to do it one of two. For me, Mark. Hmm. What's the old saying? Hip is the head that wears the crown. Put it, put the onus on us, Mark. Put the onus on us. Shoot, every base is covered. You have Florida fans. You have FSU fans. You have Miami fans, Ohio State fans, Michigan fans, et cetera. Put the onus on us. Give us a deadline, whether it's a week, two weeks. And then, hey, what you can do, you can serve as a uh, – as one of the great kings of France. And, hey, if we bring something across the, the table that, hey, you don't like, hey, just slop our heads off and that's it. Yeah. Well, there's going to be some ridiculous submissions. I always expect that. Uh, some people just have a very well, limited... Well, you know what to do? Just bring, just bring out the big hammers for it. When, when you put that out there on the, on the show, bring out the big hammer that night. And, hey, when we come out there and say that, okay, our quarterback as far as for the University of Alabama should be uh, Blake Barnett. You know, you just, <laughs> you know, politely... You know, zap us. That's it. So, so if I say Auburn and I say that, hey, the quarterback, best time all time is for Auburn, instead of saying uh, Pat Sullivan or Cam Newton, I say Nick Marshall. You just ask me to, you know, do something else, Mark. That's all. That's all. All right. I love that idea. I'm just trying to figure out again. Well, I'll have to come up with a good process here. Because if I As put always, my, Mark, thanks for indulging. Thank you I'm so much. Mark, I was just going to say when I when I put my so so I'll have people call me all the time. I'm trying to think of a good. Um. Anyway, I could slap together all sorts of things, uh, but once I put my name on something, I wanted to be ironclad, and so I want to do an exhaustive job to to make sure. Okay, I didn't miss anything. And I didn't have some huge oversight and I put something out there that's a joke because I missed I missed Barry Sanders as the best Oklahoma State running back, which of course I wouldn't do <laughs> quite that bad. But um yeah, so so it's a great idea. Sounds like something once we get past spring practice we should uh, deal with. Well, my big project, uh, Kevin, after spring practice was gonna be to rate all the positions in college football, to give you a top five at every position in every conference. So that was going to take me a while. But uh, th this is good. Indeed, indeed. And I recall you bringing that up. Yes, sir. All right, sir. Well, I appreciate the call, and I got it written right down here. And uh, we will um, – I'm not going to promise anything, but uh, I will give it strong consideration to tackle it in some way, shape, or form. Well, thanks. Greatly appreciate it. And always uh, a pleasure speaking with you, Mark. And you take care and have a good day now. You too, Kevin. All right. Uh, one other call coming in here. Oh, I think they've uh, dropped. Okay. Very good. Uh, appreciate everybody again here in the chat. Uh, David, I hope you're still on the line. Thank you so much for the uh, Super Chat contribution. Appreciate that so much. All-time teams. All right. That also reminds me that I was going to, yes, hit the thumbs up. Thank you, Huffer Belly. Huffer Billy. Apologies there. Huffer Billy Paw. Um, yeah, I was also going to rank the programs. I was going to give different weight measurements to wins, winning percentage, national championships, conference championships. All Americans possibly give some NFL love, little NFL weight to the formula and try to rank the programs all time. All right. Sounds like I need to get off here and start working on this stuff. The other thing that uh, I was uh, actually, I sat down here and I was about to uh, deliver a video on. I had listed out uh, six or seven of the top teams in the SEC and their win probabilities for all their games on their schedule. So I was just starting to work on that. I d delivered a Michigan one on the Michigan channel the other day, and it was pretty well received. People didn't think I was too far out there. And so uh, I was going to do that as well. 
as uh, uh, actually my my Saturday and Sunday, my to do list is filled up with things to to grow the channel, but nothing that you guys would see. <laughs> so it had a lot to do with all sorts of equipment stuff, marketing stuff, things I need to learn about YouTube, all that kind of stuff that wouldn't necessarily produce more content um, because I think I've got too much content actually. But uh, man, I want to do so much more when it, you start talking about all time rankings. I would love to dive into that. And also again, um, wow. Okay. Again, rest in peace, uh, Howard Schnellenberger, great all-time head coach for various uh, teams and programs, most notably at Miami in building what was then a juggernaut, and maybe the program was saved due to him. Thank you so much, everyone, for jumping on. Uh, check out the videos. We released one this morning on Florida State. Uh, we had a tremendous conversation with Corey Brada of the Hawkeye of the Storm, and we're releasing those in two sections. The first one was released offense, defense, schedule on Iowa football, the first time we've really dived into Iowa football for quite some time. The next time we'll be live, well, who knows? Most notably, it should be Monday at noon with Pigskin Pete on his channel, Monday back here at 6 o'clock Eastern time with all of you here on the call-in show. So good to see everyone out there. Cheryl, thank you so much for being a moderator. You know that. And uh, again, I appreciate everyone in here, and I will run through the, uh, the live chat here. I am doing my best to keep up with everything there, Huffer Billy. I, I tell you that. I tell you that. Man, I've got so many topics on my list. I've got pages and pages of topics while well, they're in a Google Doc that I would love to get into. But I'm um, trying to cover everything that's going on now, blanket that, and then dive into all these rankings. Wow. And I was going to rank, um, David Greenshield knows this. We had a conversation about this the other day because we always talk tiers in college football. I was thinking of giving definition to the tiers and then ranking the teams and placing them on tiers or maybe just ranking the programs 1 to 130 Mm. I thought when I decided to leave ESPN and do this full time that I would have enough time to do all that and build a business. All right. It's, it's a good problem to have. It's a good problem to have all of you here too. So thank you so much for your support. Hit the like button. That's one way you can support. There are a zillion other ways, Venmo, PayPal, cash app, share the videos on social media. Join us on Patreon. Grab the link in the description section. Use the Amazon link that we've got provided. Just a number of ways you can help us build the channel and, and keep this thing running for a long, long time. All right, everyone. Appreciate it. Uh, we'll be back live on Monday. Keep those notifications. And Lewis uh, mentioned here in the live chat that the notifications did not work for him. So two things I want to check on today as well. Notifications. I heard from Pigskin Pete the other day that sometimes the notifications get switched by YouTube. Google, they default the notifications and you got to go back in and reset them. Uh, number two, uh, from time to time, I get complaints about ads and I don't want the viewing experience to be negative. I want it to be a positive viewing experience. So keep that in mind. Um, let me message somebody who's calling me right this second. Um, a little personal call there. I'll get back to them in just a second. What was I talking about? Ads. I don't want to make it um, a non-pleasurable experience for you to watch my videos. At the same time, I got to make money. We've got to build a business here. We've got to make this happen. So I want it to be reasonable. So I'm trying to find where that is because it's not as easy as setting up the settings to where it's very clear about where these ads are going to be. So sometimes I'll set it and all of a sudden, you know, I hate watching people's videos when their ads popping up every three minutes. So I don't want that. Maybe an ad at the beginning that you can click out of after five seconds. And then if I've got a 
12 minute video and add halfway through. That's what I'm looking to do. And that's the way I've set it up. Uh, but it's not necessarily that way. When I hear back from a few people that are like, uh, Mark, I, I love this video, but I had to weed through all these ads. Well, I don't want to do that to you. Unfortunately, there have to be ads. When we get to the point where I've got so many sponsorships and so many affiliate marketing links and all that, you know, I may shut down the ads. I don't know on YouTube, but uh, we're a long ways from that. <laughs> so uh, I've got to have ads, but I just don't want them to be all over the place where you guys are going crazy just trying to watch a video because I know what that's like um, to experience that. I've even thought about uh, getting what is it, a YouTube premium where you bypass all the ads because I just think from a business standpoint, it's just wasting my time when I'm searching around, looking at things, constantly looking at ads. So uh, I don't want that to be uh, a hindrance to your viewing experience here. Reasonable Gump. Mark, can you verbalize in the video when an ad is coming and then place the ad there? Um, I have noticed other people that are much more savvy when it comes to YouTube have obviously figured out exactly when that that's going to hit and they'll lead you up to a certain point where you definitely want to see the next thing out of their mouth or hear the next thing. And then boom, they hit you with an ad. So they, and there's a timeline and you can, you can mess around with all that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so I think it can be done. I'm not going to promise anything there. Buckeye River Rat, good to see you. And then over on Patreon, I don't know if they want this, but a number of people have uh, requested. Thank you, Cheryl. You have a great weekend, too. Uh, a number of people have requested like an insider look. So I've tried to mix that up with football and we'll do a live stream over there sometime next weekend, whenever uh, people are available and uh, request that. All right. Uh, so join us on Patreon for, for basically one of two reasons, either number one, you just want to help me build the channel and don't care what I provide there. And I say that blatantly just because that's what people have told me over there. I never thought that I would build a Patreon channel and not deliver anything. I'd never wanted to do that, but people have gotten on there and said, you know, Mark, when I've asked them, what do you want here? Tons of people have told me, well, I've only got 50 people there, so not tons, but uh, a number of people have told me, Mark, don't really care. Just giving you five bucks a month to support everything that you do on YouTube. But I want to provide something of value there uh, that's way worth more than uh, five bucks a month. So it is five bucks a month on Patreon. So please uh, join us there. I do have my predictions there, which uh, don't help you a whole lot until September, of course, but you would have made a lot of money last year. <clears throat> Some money. I'm not going to over tout my predictions. <clears throat> you get the uh, Steve Merrill look, uh, uh, his uh, special pick per week. Uh, you get the insider look at the voice of college football. Uh, I displayed all my, newly purchased equipment here a few weeks ago and we had a live stream we've got the live streams exclusive there where that are a little bit more intimate uh discussions and of course um watch parties as well they're on patreon so i would ask that you would join us there as well appreciate that that we can always have these uh little candid conversations about what's going on here at the voice of college football and of course you're a huge part of it uh, believe that because <clears throat> When I had 100 subscribers, I was pretty much doing the same thing. I was breaking down football games. And there were like 13 people that were watching the videos. Not that I've got a huge audience now, but what I'm basically saying is I am going to continue to take strides to build this into a better platform. It's going to look better, sound better, do all those things. So we took care of the call-in process finally. Got that, bought a soundboard, got a good system. Thanks to Bobby McGraw, Volunteer Roadshow, all, all these things we did. I bought a nice new camera, and it's sitting over there, and I'm learning how to use it. Uh, I got a, got a switcher board over here that we need to implement uh, to, for graphics and other things. We're going to work on that. 
I've got all sorts of uh, YouTube workshops that I'm going through right now that I've paid for uh, to try to figure out how to expand on here that people can find us. Uh, so I'm working on all those things. But uh, when it comes down to it, if you don't like it, if you don't respond, then I'm just going to sit up here and talk to no one. So thank you because you're building the channel. You're growing the channel. So continue to help with the sharing of the videos, liking the videos, your financial support's always appreciated. And um, of course, find us a sponsor. <laughs> we would love that. All right, here at the uh, Voice of College Football, we will see all of you uh, on Monday, if not sooner. And uh, again, it's always appreciated. And uh, I'm out.